model you train your model and then you evaluate it it goes through testing you you do a deployment and then you monitor your model and then this whole cycle uh, repeats itself again so let's uh, lay uh, let's take a look at it one by one so let's start with pre processing because the first step of training any model uh, is data pre processing where you gather your data uh, where you gather your data from different sources as per your use case and then there are certain pre processing steps which you need to perform on top of your data so uh, if you see over here we uh, we take a raw data set we so uh, when we were doing, doing fine tuning we saw an example of a common crawl data set and uh, the example which we saw the data set which we saw was uh, processed and was structured enough it, it was in a state which could be used to train a model but when you are scraping a data from the web uh, the data is most of it is gibberish because when uh, when you are scraping a data from uh, any of the website uh, the text which is extracted is basically uh, it is the html file which is extracted and uh, from that html file you extract the text so uh, i'll show you an example of how the uh, data looks like when uh, sorry just give me one second my phone just started echoing yeah so uh, when we do a text extraction from an html so this is so uh, when we do a text extraction from an html sorry so this is Something is wrong. Okay. Yeah. So this is how the data looks. Uh, if you see, this doesn't make much sense. Uh, skip to, if you see the data over here, it says skip to make main content, skip to footer, skip to email. Like if someone reads this, it, it doesn't make any sense, right? So we need to, to further format this data so that it is in a readable format and which it should be in in a, in a form where the language model could learn and understand uh, you know uh, the concepts of english language from that data so uh, first you extract the text from all these websites and then you perform cleaning and filtering so what happens in cleaning and filtering is you remove unwanted tags like uh, uh, you know you remove css which makes no sense some html tags like uh, iframe header photos which makes no sense so all those uh, data is being cleaned out and then there is uh, there are certain fil there's certain filtering which is done on top of that data like you remove the toxic content from it you remove unwanted content which is not uh, applicable for your use case so you need to do those kind of filtering on top of your data then there is something called as called as quality filtering so uh, when you gather a large amount of data you need to figure out whether uh, the data which you are using is is of the quality which you expect which you expect so there is a matrix called as perplexity matrix which is used to figure out the quality of a document uh, how that works is usually there is another model which is trained uh, let's say there's a model which is trained on wikipedia data and then you are, you want your data to be the standard of wikipedia so uh, you you put your content through that uh, language model and that language model will tell you whether that content is of high perplex perplexity or low perplexity if the data is of low perplexity that's considered to be good and a uh, good and of high quality so the quality filtering is done and then you remove the duplicate data you remove duplicacies from your data and then uh, there is something which uh, then you need to remove your personal data as well because any PII information in your data set is a security concern so there are again language models which are trained to figure out whether uh, 
the 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 data set which you are using has any personal information or not so you can use language models for these kind of pre processing as well so this is in nutshell like these are the steps which we need to take while preparing our data and uh, uh, preparing our data to uh, to use that to train our model and uh, so data pre-processing also involves tokenization so once our pre-training data set is uh, uh, is in is is in a structured format then we can you know do tokenization on top of it and then prepare the data in the form uh, form which the language model can accept okay so now once we have prepared our data set we use the data to train our model but to train the model first we need to uh, determine the architecture of the model so depending on our use case we can either use uh, an encoding model or uh, encoder architecture or a decoder architecture or uh, like uh, for translation related tasks and mo uh, models like t5 they use both encoder and decoder architecture so depending on that you first need to finalize your mo uh, you need to figure out what model architecture you're going to use and then uh, you use the data set which you have prepared for the pre-training phase. You use that data uh, to train your model. So if you see the training process is an iterative process in itself. So you, uh, you train the model uh, and then you do an er error analysis on top of it. And if uh, during the error analysis, you figure out if you need more data or you need to tune the hyperparameters and things like that. So you do those mod modifications, you do the training again until uh, you get an expected, uh, uh, until your model starts performing as expected, right? So if you're training a model from scratch, these are the, I mean, pre-training is what you're going to go ahead with. But if you're already, uh, if you're using a pre-trained, uh, model then you're going to uh, you you will probably be training the model on a smaller subset of data uh, you're just going to fine-tune that model so fine-tuning pre-training and hyperparameter tuning so all these steps are part of your model training right so once your model is trained then comes the deployment part of it so how do you deploy your model uh, you can either deploy your model offline, like you can put your model on device and uh, that would work for you, or you can uh, uh, serve it as an endpoint and uh, inject that endpoint into your application, or you can do batch predictions, you can schedule batch jobs uh, for your use case. So this is how you can uh, deploy the model. Uh, but there are uh, there are various deployment patterns which are common across uh, machine learning models. Uh, patterns such as so one of the common patterns is shadow deployment. What happens in shadow deployment is uh, let's say you are uh, deploying your model for the first time. Okay, so your model is going to uh, you don't know how your model is going to react on live data on real uh, or on real time data so what we do is we deploy our, mod our model we open it to to the inputs from the uh, live data but whatever response the output generates that is not uh, sent back to the user so in parallel either uh, you know uh, either you can have a human intervention or you can have an older model which is there. So let's, if, if I take an example of GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. So GPT 3.5 is already running and it is already uh, generating some response for the input prompts. Now, if you want to test how GPT 4 is uh, going to respond to the same inputs, we will do a shadow deployment of that particular model. We will generate the response from GPT 4 and uh, that response will not be sent to the user but we will gather those uh, responses and we'll monitor if the new model is basically generating the text as expected and once we are satisfied with the results we can then roll that out uh, to the live users so that is one common deployment pattern which is used across 
another one is blue green blue green pattern so blue green pattern is basically uh, you have a router in between and then uh, so you both your old model and new deploy uh, new model are deployed okay and uh, so you have a router which can which can point your request to either the old router or to the new router that configuration is in our hand so we can uh, when we are ready to deploy our model we can point the route we just have to change the pointing of the router to the new model and if in case the new model doesn't perform as expected we can always switch it back to the old model so that is called as blue green deployment which is another deployment pattern uh, commonly used and uh, there is one more uh, common deployment pattern which is known as canary deployment so in canary deployment what happens is the model uh, you you are basically opening that model only for a small fraction of the audience and uh, once you test that model on that small fraction and you're satisfied then uh, it is it is basically open to wider audience so uh, that uh, in a nutshell is about uh, model deployment model deployment is also an iterative process so you deploy the model you monitor the traffic you do performance analysis you do some changes and uh, if if needed like if you want to add more data or less data if, if there is some changes needed in the training phase you train the model so this loop goes again and then your model is ready for deployment so these are iterative processes okay uh then moving on to model monitoring so once your model is deployed uh you need to monitor the model and uh, model monitoring is a very important step because uh, you know our models are trained on enormous amount of data and your data can your data will change over time right so there there are these two concepts uh, there are uh, these two terminologies concept drift and data drift so what is a concept drift concept drift occurs when the relationship between the input data and the target variable changes over time so for example uh an llm that is trained to generate text summaries of news article may become less accurate over time if the format of the news article changes right and what is data drift data drift is when the statistical properties of the input data changes over time like uh, a perfect example is factual inac inaccuracies so uh you can take an example of uh, another example where Uh, if an llm is trained to generate product recommendations that may become less accurate if if the preference of customers change over time so your data can change over time sorry uh so yeah so these are the uh, these are the drifts which we we need to monitor we need to monitor uh, what kind of output your model is generating and then depending on that we need to take actions so another way of monitoring is defining a certain set of mat matrices so for language models uh, it is all so it is recommended that in initial stage you define a lot of matrices and then you test your model on those matrices to uh, to ensure that your model is working uh, properly uh, some of the common matrices which can be used are first is the accuracy accuracy and performance so you you check how well your uh, model is performing on an intended task and you can do this using a variety of matrices such as blue uh, blue score or accuracy matrices then you can check the fluency of the model how fluent and readable uh, is the text which is generated by the llm okay uh this can be measured using uh, metrics such as perplexity which we uh, which is spoke about in in the previous slide then there is something called as co coherence coherence is basically you're testing your uh, language model uh, on common sense so whatever the text which is generated from the language model does that make sense or not so that is co coherence then uh bias you you can you need to check whether the output which is generated is whether it is a biased or offensive output and what uh, uh, 
you know measures you can take uh, to fix that so there are fairness and uh, safety matrices out there which can be used to detect bias uh, in your model similarly you can uh, uh, apply matrices for robustness speed and cost of the language models so you can add these matrices uh, in your monitoring and then you can set alerts on top of it so if if you if the model uh, if you see any anomalies in the model in terms of these uh, these matrices uh, it would send you an alert and then you can take uh, uh, action to address those issues okay so the this is the basic workflow of a machine learning model and we i spoke through it in keeping in keeping in mind that we are going to train a language model but now let's see how what is the workflow of a large language model so the first thing which you do is you select a foundation model okay so you select a foundation model uh, you do prompt engineering on top of it and uh, you evaluate the result if you are satisfied uh, with the result uh, you evaluate the result you, if you are satisfied with the result then you deploy that uh, uh, model to production and then you you continue your testing on to production for that model uh, if you think that there is a room for improvement then uh, you figure out the data set which can help you help the model improve and then you use that uh, data to fine tune your model and then again this iterative process goes on so you fine tune your model that then you again evaluate results on top of that model and if there is a room of room for improvement you again uh, perform that training process so machine learning workflows are iterative in nature and uh, we we need to continuously monitor these models for uh, better performance right so this is all about the the workflow of a language mod model now let's see how we can achieve this on cloud how we can achieve this using uh, vertex ai platform okay so Cool. Okay, so moving ahead to Vertex AI. So Vertex AI is a unified ML ops platform. Uh, it is a it is a platform which you know uh, provides you in. Uh, so if you're using Vertex AI, you don't need to worry about infrastructure management or security and things like that. Uh, and you only pay for what you're using. Okay. And then Vertex AI provides you model as a service. So there are a lot of models uh, available in model gardens, which you can directly use. You can uh, directly use as an API and uh, or you can uh, use a foundation model. You can then use your data to fine tune that uh, foundation model as per your use case we'll have a look at that uh, uh, shortly in in a in a while uh, it also helps you streamline your model development so what does this mean is uh, there are tools in vertex ai which will help you automate the process so when we uh, spoke about data pre processing right there are multiple steps which you need to take uh, during pre-processing your data so you can create a pipeline with those steps with those functions included and if you're using another language model to to basically uh, you know uh, process some some part of your data you can create a pipeline with those steps and you can save that pipeline so that you know that can be used in future so let's say you have uh, pre-trained a model using that particular pipeline now you want to use the same model and you want to fine tune it further on you know on on for a particular use case you can then use the same data pipeline to generate your data set 
okay so that uh, reduces a lot of uh, manual effort so that way you can create pipelines for your different stages uh, in your ml work ml workflow so you can create a pipeline for training process and then you can create a pipeline for your deployment and then you can connect all of that uh, to uh, to ensure the continuous uh, uh, continuous uh, to to ensure the continuous integration and continuous deployment okay so yeah so vertex ai provides you model garden generative ai studio and uh, ml platforms so model gardens is a tool which has open source a lot of open source models it has foundation models it has pre-trained models which you can use directly then uh, you can uh, you can use the generative ai studio where you can play around with prompts you can save those prompts like you can do experiments with models and you can save those experiments and share those experiments with uh, with uh, with your team so that uh, um, so that they don't, you, you know, there's no duplicate effort uh, uh, in uh, in that phase, right? You can also use generative uh, AI studio for fine tuning, and the fine tuning, uh, like fine tuning in generative AI studio, is uh, is like a three step process. You just need to provide your JSON data, you your data set uh, into the UI, you just need to upload your uh, data set and then you can start the pipeline, which will basically tune the model. We'll see this also in action in a bit. Okay, so uh, this is the generative AI workflow for Google. Uh, it, this is basically Vertex AI, the generative AI workflow. And uh, so if you look, over here is there is this responsible and AI safety layer in between, uh, you know, the prompts and the foundation model. So if anyone is trying to get some unwanted uh, data out or toxic data out from the uh, foundation model, this layer will protect it. So what this layer does is it, uh, it has basically, uh, it will check the input and the output, uh, the, the input prompts as well as the output generated. And it checks uh, the input and the, uh, and the output generated on certain uh, attributes, certain secure uh, safety attributes, such as, you know, uh, is there any toxic content in, that, in there or uh, content related to war and crime or politics or, you know, uh, illicit drugs and things like that. So uh, it checks that and if someone is trying to get that data out, it will send a very generic response saying, uh, uh, sorry, I cannot do that. I'm just a model. So this is <clears throat> this layer is basically doing that. And uh, then in Generative AI Studio UI, we have a panel for prompt where we can play around with the prompt. So we'll, we'll have a look at that in a bit. Think okay. Let's jump into Vertex AI and look at that. So just give me one second. I'll get that. Okay. Hope you can see my screen. No. Can you see the Google Chrome on the screen? Okay, just give me one second, I think.
sorry just give me one moment this seems to be some issue with my okay i think this should work okay can you see the vertex ai screen now okay cool i'll just increase the zoom a bit yeah okay cool so uh, this is the vertex ai ui uh, let's start with uh, the model gardens so if i go here uh, there are a lot of foundation models over here uh, like you can see palm 2 for text you can also see uh, the llama 2 which is from meta you can use these foundation models and then you know you can directly deploy uh, this model to an endpoint. So if you click this, it will run in pipe. Yeah. You can just provide your model name. You can save this and then, you know, you can deploy this uh, to an endpoint. Uh, also, you can fine tune, you can use these models to fine tune it. We'll, we'll look at that as well. And just one more thing over here is it gives you the description of the model. So, how many parameters it has been trained on, what is the context length, okay. Use cases, what for what use cases you can use this model and things like that, okay. What, yeah, I was looking for this option. So you can also open this in a notebook and then you can play around with this. So if I, if I click this, uh, it will basically open a notebook uh, with this LLM, LLM with the Llama 2 model. Okay. Um, if I go back. Yeah. So uh, if I just filter on language models, these are the language models uh, which are available. These are the fine tunable models which are there. And there are some task specific models also available. So you can play around with these models. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, you, you can try out some cool use cases over here. Uh, let's go to Generative AI Studio now. And I will open the language one. So here you can play around with prompts. So let's try with a text prompt. Let's just give a sample prompt. How is the, how is the weather today? And uh, so this is going to use this text bison model. And you can play around with the hyperparameter values over here. Uh, these hyperparameter values we discussed in the last session. So you can, you know, play around with the temperature over here. Let's see how, what response does it. Generate. It's it generated a very random response that it is currently 47 degree in New York, and it feels like this. Well, you can play around here, uh, you know, with different models. So you can check the available models over here, and then uh, you can do experimentations over here. You can save these experiments, and then you can share these experiments with your team. Okay, I am going to come out of this then let's go to tuning a model so here you can choose a tuning tuning method so we select the supervised tuning method we go here which we select the base model on which we want to tune so right now we have only four options text bison code bison or uh, chat bison so these are i think palm uh, uh, palm versions of it uh, you can define the model name over here and then you can define the training step. You can define the learning rate over here and uh, you have to define the location where the model needs to be uh, saved. So you can define a cloud storage bucket over here. You can define uh, any location of your choice. Then, okay, let me just give one Google Cloud put. Google Cloud Vertex AI bucket. And I'll give this a test model. Okay. 
okay if i continue over here okay here you can def you can uh, provide your json l file so you can provide any i mean you can create a, a sample input uh, sample json line files with an input text attribute and an output text attribute so currently you need to provide the text only in this format for it to work and uh, once you provi provide a json l file and uh, you provide the uh, location over here the google cloud location over here you click continue and uh, it will uh, start a pipeline which will basically tune your model i cannot show show the live demo over here because it takes time to tune a model but you can try this on your own uh just uh just be mindful that these things are chargeable so i think you get a 300 dollar credit uh, uh initially so you can play around with those credits right uh, so you can do prompt tuning, you can do fine tuning over here in Generative AI Studio. All right, you can, uh, you know, you can play around with all these things. All right, so let me go back to my slide. Okay. okay. There seems to be something wrong. Yeah. Okay. I think it is back. Okay. Okay. So there are a lot of tools with which Vertex AI provides, but what's the right tool for you? That depends on. So if you have your own training data, then uh. If you don't have your own training data, then you can always use the pre-trained APIs uh, from the model garden. But if you have your uh, training data, then uh, you, and if you are writing uh, the model code yourself, then you can use the custom model tuning. If not, then you can use the AutoML tool from Vertex AI. So Vertex AI provides all of these tools to help with uh, uh, the development of your uh, large language models okay so uh, if you see the data sets the, the data labeling data sets these two the feature store all these tools uh, help you in your data pre-processing stage then uh, training visor optimization experiments all these tools helps you in your model training phase so you can use visor optimization for your hyperparameter tuning and things like that then you know the prediction uh, explainable ai hybrid ai all these are used for your model deployment and then you can do continuous monitoring and metadata so that is it about vertex ai uh, so a deployed model is only the beginning and uh, to avoid concept and model drift ml models often need to be continuously monitored retrained and updated and that's where pipeline can help us automate this workflow so as we discussed the whole of the machine learning flow is an iterative process in itself and uh, it is best to define pipelines so you can pipe you can define pipelines at every stage uh, you can define pipelines in your data pre-processing stage in your model deployment uh, in the training stage and then in model deployment and continuous monitoring right so I'm not getting into the details of pipelines. Uh, 
considering the time how does ml ops fits into the app development uh, so basically your ml ops fits over here in the application backend where uh, you know, Vertex AI or any other uh, uh, cloud platform uh, can help you uh, with your model development and deployment, can help you automate your model development and deployment process. And then, you know, you can then call your models from the desktop client or the model or the mobile client. Uh, I think I will stop over here and I'll uh, do, uh, I'll move on to the demo so for the demo what i have done is i have uh, taken a gpt2 base a gpt2 fine-tuned model a gpt2 model which is fine-tuned uh, on a cnn mail data set and uh, i ha i have taken that fine-tuned model and use TensorFlow Lite to basically optimize uh, the generated model. And then that model is being injected onto a mobile device. So uh, it is a mobile app, which is basically interacting with the model directly. So let me just share that. Okay. I'll I'll ping the collab in the link. Uh, you can play around with this in your own time. So this is this is a collab from Google's uh, uh, Google's documentation only, and it has description of how it works. So do give it a try, and. Okay, yeah. So this is the collab. And if you see here, we are taking a, a GPT-2 model, which is fine tuned uh, with uh, the daily mail data set. And we are using Keras library over here, Keras NLP. Okay, so I'm just calling uh, uh, this function from this Keras NLP library dot models uh, GP2 gpt2 causal causal lm and then we are just getting the cnn daily mail uh, fine-tuned data and then we are generating uh, we are generating the text on uh, using that model so this is our model over here right so when i when i execute this step this is basically our mod our model and on on this uh, on this we are executing this generate function which is basically generating the text now what tensorflow lite does is it will take this model this fine-tuned model which is uh, basically uh, generated over here and you yeah and then it basically optimizes these uh, generate and inference functions and uh, there are there are various optimization techniques which it uses and uh, then it generates a tf light file so if i talk about the uh, if i talk about uh, the gpt2 model uh, the fine tune model after optimization the file size was around uh, 250 250 mb and because gpt2 is a small model we could after optimization we could get it to 250 mb but for a larger model it would uh, i mean optimization to such extent would be difficult okay so i have then then taken this tf light file and i have injected uh, this into the Android Studio. So this is a, a very simple Android application which has a text box. And uh, if I enter a text over here, I'm sorry, I'll just restart this. 
Yeah, so this is an Android application. And what I've done is I've just taken that TF light file over here and I've added it to our assets folder. Okay. And now if I give a prompt as uh, give a prompt as breaking news London snow. And if I click on generate, So it basically generates the text. So this would work offline as well, even if, uh, you know, even if I switch off the Wi-Fi over here, uh, this app would work because the model is directly deploy deployed onto the application. So let's say if I switch off this and I turn off the Wi-Fi, right? And then let's give another try. because it's a cnn data i'm just i'm just trying to generate uh, breaking news but we i mean you can play around with this with your own prompts okay let's see what it generates this time Yeah, so if you see it generates London Bridge collapse, the collapse of London Bridge is a tragic loss. So this is working offline and it is it is really cool to see a model being deployed onto an Android app. All right, so uh, I'll stop here. And I will open for questions. If there are no questions, then probably we are good to close. You can use retrieval augmentation uh, using Vertex AI, but you will have to build your own uh, architecture around it. So you will have to build your own retriever and then you'll have to you know, connect that retriever to the model. So those kind of connectivity setup you'll have to do, but you, you can definitely uh, use that method uh, uh, in Vertex AI. Do you have a step-by-step -step instruction about the Android app deployment or links? Yes, so the collab which I have mentioned over here, it has, uh, if you can just open and check that, it has step-by-step -step instruction. And also, uh, I will send another link which should be helpful. It's a code lab which I referred to, and that should be helpful. Okay. okay. Is there anything else? Uh, I recently read one book on, on design of LLM. I, for some reason, can't uh, remember the, uh, the name of it, but that, that was also a very good book. Uh, but I can suggest you other online resources. Uh, definitely try uh, deeplearning.ai. It has a lot of like short courses and it has it has courses on Langchain. Langchain is also one of the uh, most common frameworks used for LLM devel uh, development of large language models. So do check out courses on Langchain and do try that out. And uh, yeah.
or just give me a minute i can i actually search for that book and tell the name yeah designing large language models here yeah, i think that's the name so do check that out it is it is actually a good book definitely there are courses like you can find a, a course on uh, is something hello hello okay cool uh, so deep learning uh, designing uh, large language models uh yeah and on the above question for uh, focus more on ux and front end design of llms and uh, yes yes that's the one on yeah so on front end design also i think there is a course on deeplearning.ai which covers that aspect uh, so do check that okay uh, if there's anything else yeah so there is this this course building generative applications with gradio on deep learning you can check that cool thank you so much everyone hope it was helpful and hope you were able to learn uh, about uh, llms thank you cheers bye